very interesting application and lots of more things. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers, Daniel, particularly for organizing this and giving me this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the third lecture series on optimal transport. And you might have heard um, S. Penn talk about this uh, yesterday on two lectures where he developed the foundations. I'm going to, again, recap a few things. And uh, what I will sort of do is to give a statistical application, a concrete statistical application, uh, where optimal transport arises naturally. And I'll go through the examples and so on. Okay. By the way, this is uh, sort of a boot camp. So please interrupt me if you have any questions. Please, please interrupt. Okay, so the, the plan is basically I want to do non-parametric testing, okay? And I want to do non-parametric testing in multi-dimensions. And particularly, I want to do distribution-free non-parametric testing. And the, the meaning will be clear uh, once I go into the uh, topic in particular. And I will be crucially using the theory of optimal transport to do this. That's why I feel it's a, it's a nice application of optimal transport. So the plan is I'll, of course, uh, formulate the problem of uh, non parametric testing. And then I'll talk about uh, the optimal transport uh, uh, part necessary, uh, which will be just the Monge's problem, which is something, again, I'll try to uh, connect it to uh, S. Penn's talk yesterday. So this is what actually S. Penn talked about. But I'll just give you a recap. And then the two main applications uh, of non parametric testing is testing for goodness of fit. Uh, and I'll talk about two samples of goodness of fit testing multivariate, and also testing for the independence of two random vectors. So the focus is in doing things in multi in multi dimension. And uh, as you will see, there is a long literature for dimensions uh, for the one dimensional case. Okay. So uh, let's start. So let's dive in. Uh, so the two problems I'll consider on non parametric testing is I have the xi's x1 to xm coming from a distribution p1. And the yj is coming from a distribution p2. Um, the, the, there are i-i-bit samples, and two samples are independent. I want to test whether the p1 is equal to p2 or not. Okay, so that's what we usually call the two, two sample goodness of fit testing, or testing for the equality of two distributions. Note, um, the focus is on multivariate distributions, where d, the dimension of the problem, can be larger than or equal to 1. Okay. Now, there is a long, long list of methods to do this, particularly things started in, say, about 80 years back by the, uh, the Kolmogorov two-sample test. Uh, and then you had the classical non-parametrics um, that people talk about, uh, including the Wilcoxon test. I'll talk quite a bit about this Wilcoxon paper. And, uh, but of course, for the last uh, 50 years, the majority of the emphasis has been in trying to understand the case d greater than 1. And then uh, one of the uh, uh, earlier works is this uh, uh, graph-based testing procedure by uh, Friedman and Ratsky based on the minimal spanning tree, k nearest neighbor methods. Uh, and then you have depth-based ideas. Then you have the kernel uh, literature, um, which the machine learners like quite a bit, I think. Uh, this is a kernel to sample test by Arthur Gretton and collaborators, and so on. Very long history. The second problem I'm going to consider is testing for the mutual independence of two random vectors. So I observe IID data of x and y, n many of them, and uh, x is d1 dimensional, y is d2 dimensional. I want to test is if x is independent of y okay. from this. And again, uh, there's a huge literature, more than 100 years old. You can imagine when d1 and d2 is 1, one of the earliest measures is the correlation, right? That's the Pearson's correlation. Now, uh, so you have the Spearman's rank correlation coming at the, around the same point of time. And then a whole bunch of methods. Häufting, I think, proposed the first non-parametric way of testing for independence. And for the last uh, 50 years, there's been a more emphasis on the multivariate case. Again, this is the kernel test, uh, hilbert schmidt independence criteria by Arthur Gretton and collaborators. Okay? So these are the two problems I'll be trying to study. So now to motivate uh, what is the contribution, uh, so I, we will talk about a framework in which we can do distribution-free inference. And I'm going to talk about it uh, uh, in more detail. But to give you a picture of what's uh, happened, uh, of, 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 of what the main uh, features of the procedure would be, 
let's try to start from the simplest of things. Okay, now again, I know this is a diverse audience, but um, this, this is of course a very simple slide, but I think it's important to uh, look at this and try to uh, extend it because we will be looking at the case where d is greater than one. So I have a two sample testing problem. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm in the simplest of parametric models. Xi is come from a normal mu one sigma squared. Yj is come from normal mu two sigma squared. The sigma, of course, is unknown. And mu one and mu two are the location uh, parameters. You want to test whether the two distributions are the same, which means whether mu two is equal to mu one. And the alternative being mu two greater than mu one. Of course, this arises quite often. This you can think of as the control group. This is the treatment group. And you want to see if the treatment has an effect or not. Right? That's the usual setup. In this case, we know what is the best thing to do. As you can imagine, the test would be based on the difference of the sample means. So you take the yi, the yj's, look at the sample mean, and look, look at the xi's, uh, and look at the difference, and you would reject if this is large, right? That's, of course, the idea. Of course, if a uh, simple calculation shows that this has a normal distribution, uh, but sigma squared is the annoying parameter, you don't really know sigma squared, so what do you do? This is um, one of the basic things you do in statistics, you, you basically studentize. What is student size? You basically replace sigma squared by its estimate, which is the pooled uh, sample variance. And uh, this is the test statistic you get, which under the null hypothesis has an exact T distribution with m plus n minus two degrees of freedom. We know this is the uniformly most powerful and biased test in this problem. This is really the best thing to do in this particular setup. So of course, the, the test would say you would reject the null hypothesis if your uh, T statistic is bigger than uh, a particular quantile of the T distribution with n plus n minus two degrees of freedom. A few things to note, this is the exact thing to do, and this is an exact test. I know the quantile, and this is a level alpha test, okay? Of course, now let's, we are interested in non-parametric, so let's complicate things a bit. What do I do now? I say, okay, and the normal assumption is, is now left out. I have some underlying distribution F, and here it's G, which I still assume is basically a shift so the, now the non-parametric component is f, which is any distribution assumed to be a continuous distribution. And theta is the shift. I want to test whether the samples come from the same distribution, which is the same as testing whether theta equals 0 or not. Is that clear? What would you do? You can use the same t statistic. If you use the same t statistic, this would now have an approximate t distribution, right? This would not be an exact t distribution. But okay, you can still use it, and this has good performance. A lot of people use it, so for the same test can be applied. But the big drawback now is this is no longer a level alpha test, right? This is an approximate test. So this is um, approximately equal to alpha. Of course, if m and n is large, this is going to be uh, this is going to converge to alpha. But the problem also is there is no uniformity in f. If you change f, if you make it very heavy tail, this test actually might not even work because we are appealing to the central limit theorem, which works when distributions of finite variance. So this is a reasonable solution, but has these obvious problems. And the main problem arises because Tmn, the distribution of Tmn, depends on the underlying F. And using the cutoff, the T quantile cutoff, is not the right thing to do, okay? So what do we want here? We want a sort of a distribution-free approach. What is a distribution-free approach? A sort of a test statistic whose distribution would not depend on the underlying F. So which would be a universal uh, test statistic. And we want something robust, which would not, like this t, this t test would actually behave pretty poorly if the distribution is quite skewed. So we want minimal assumptions and we want a distribution-free approach so that the cutoff of the test is universal, okay? So this is the problem that motivated non-parametric statistics. And the first solution, uh, which led to the development of the whole field of classical non-parametrics, is because of this Wilcoxon Langsam test. So in 1945, Wilcoxon gave a solution to this, which uh, was neat and, and actually avoided all the two drawbacks that we saw, that, that, that we just saw. So what is this test? And again, this is an important slide. If you don't know what the Wilcoxon Langsam test is, uh, we should try to understand this. So what Wilcoxon did is, of course, now I have m many xi's, uh, n many yj's. I I pool them, I have m plus n many observations, and I rank them, okay? So I arrange them in increasing order. And then I look at the rank of xi. So what is the rank of xi? And I call it ri. So ri would be n, would be some, some, some i over n. Capital N is n plus n. 
So suppose the smallest observation out of the, all the pooled observation is suppose x3, then the rank of x3 is just one on n. Suppose the second smallest is y7, then the rank of y7 is two over n. So note, I'm emphasizing it, it has to be the pooled rank, okay? So you do that, and then you do something very similar as we did before. In the previous t-test, we just looked at the difference of the averages of the two samples. Here, you just take the sum of the ranks of the second sample. You might have just taken the difference with the ranks of the first sample, but as the ranks are all going to be i over n, uh, it's the sum of that, su sum of both of these would be the sum of all these numbers. So it doesn't really matter to take the rank of the ris. We might as well consider only the second sample. And you would reject, if you would see, on an average, the ranks of the yj's are larger. Right? That makes perfect sense. So this is the Wilcoxon rank sum test. So for the first point I want to make is basically this, we arrived at the test arrived using the same principle as we got using the two sample t-test, but instead of the observations, we replaced them by their pooled ranks. That's the important thing to realize. Yes. Yeah, so uh, of course, you, uh, see, I'm, uh, if theta is greater than zero, then the yj's would be in general larger, right? So the ranks of the yj's would be larger. So you would be rejecting for a qj is larger than something, right? Now, of course, you could have taken this minus the sum of the ri's, but a summation of qj plus summation of ri is the sum of all these numbers. It's a deterministic quantity. I might as well forget that. Okay, so that, that's why I say it's basically equivalent to the two sample t-test. And I'm using the same principle. The only change I have made is I've replaced the values xi's and yj's and I've plugged in the ranks. That's all I have done. And now something interesting happens. This test statistic is distribution free. What does that mean? That means the distribution of this no longer depends on the underlying f. If you recall in my last slide, I was trying to emphasize the problem with the t-test in this problem is the distribution of the t-statistic is not exactly a t-distribution, it's approximate e-t, but here, whatever f is, as long as it's continuous, you have the same distribution of summation qj. Uh, and why is that? It's kind of easy to see, because this is, of course, a test statistic which is a function of the joint rank vector. So it's a function of the ris and the qj's. And if the null hypothesis is true, which means all these come from the same distribution, they're all exchangeable. So this long vector of m plus n many of ranks is distributed uniformly over the n factorial permutations of these numbers. So now you see somehow this test statistic has an exact distribution and I can exactly find out its critical value, which no longer depends on f, which gives me an exact test which is valid for every f. Is that clear? So um, that's, uh, that's so, so that of course leads to the fact we have a universal critical value which gives me an exact test whatever f is and the critical value only of course depends on m and n and of course the level of significance alpha but it does not depend on f. That's the most important part. Okay? So um, that is the Wilcoxon rank sum test the, which is the same as the man making test. Now, let's compare the two. So we have a very simple goodness of fit testing problem in one dimension. The two sample t-test is the most natural thing to do. The Wilcoxon rank sum is another thing to do. The Wilcoxon rank sum is, of course, distribution free because its distribution under the null does not depend on the f, on the underlying distribution f. And it's an exact test, whereas the two sample t-test is not distribution free, is not an exact test. It's only an approximate test. Okay, so. The, now, there are some remarkable things that happen. So you can compute the asymptotic efficiency of this test. And what this theorem, first of all, says is that, okay, so of course, you may imagine, you know that the t-test is actually the uniformly most powerful unbiased test. So if the underlying distribution is Gaussian, there is no better test. And this test, which somehow seems, can seem a bit ad hoc, has efficiency 0.95. That roughly means the power of the, uh, the test, so, uh, if you take 1,000 observations and you have the Wilcoxon rank sum test, it will have some power. 
the same power will be obtained by 950 observations with the t-test. So this is very close to one. Of course, it's less than one, but it's very close to one. So, so that's good. You don't lose much. And here's a very remarkable result, which goes back to Hodges and Lemon, which says there's a non-trivial lower bound. Whatever distribution you take, the efficiency of the Wilcoxon Ransom test can never fall below 0.846. And of course, if you have heavy tail distributions, the efficiency can be plus infinity. The t test will be a very bad test, whereas the Wilcoxon Ransom test will be a very good thing to do. So, this is actually a remarkable result, and in some sense, justifies the use of random tail procedures. That in some sense, you get distribution freeness, an exact test statistic, and you don't really suffer much in terms of efficiency, okay? Is that clear? So, uh, so this is what, as I said, this is one of the seminal papers that created the field of classical non-parametrics, so as to say. And there are actually thousands of papers, in, in literally tens of thousands of papers that followed, and statisticians in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s really tried to understand rank-based methods in numerous problems. And the advantage of all of this is that you have a weak set of assumptions. The t-test would fail if you have distribution f, which, which has no second moment. This would not fail. It has high efficiency. And it's robust to outliers and contamination. And of course, leads to distribution-free methods. So these are some of the advantages of using ranked based methods in one dimension. But now, there is little known beyond d equal to 1. This example that I've just tried to illustrate only talks about the case d equal to 1. And there's an entire uh, book, books written, actually Aryan teaches this course on classical non-parametrics where you do essentially dimension one all the time. And what I want to address is the case where I have multivariate data that d is bigger than one. What are natural generalizations of this? That's what, and you will see the theory of optimal transport plays a very crucial role in all this, okay? So this is basically the prelude to what is going to come. Any questions here? Any questions? Okay, good. So, um, as you will see, so we will try to develop a general framework uh, for multivariate distribution free testing based on ranks. Okay. And this has gotten the recent attention. And these ranks, these multivariate ranks, are defined using the theory of optimal transport. And I think Mark Halim, who is a, a renowned statistician at, uh, in Belgium, was probably the first to observe that optimal transport is very intricately involved in this. And he, and he was motivational, and I have done some work uh, after in interacting with him. And this talk is mostly borrowed from this paper with uh, Navarone Dev, who is a student in the stats department, and myself. Okay? So, and again, you can ask him, why ranks, right? It's why are we using ranks? Why do we want to study multivariate ranks? And the answer is very simple. In one dimensions, anything that's distribution free is based on ranks. So the idea is, and again, this is, we, we talked about the Wilcoxon ranks on test, but the same is true for the two-sample Kolmogorov's run of test, the two-sample Kramer von Mises test, the wolf wolfowitz run test, and the list continues, so on. The Hoyerdings D test is a test for independence. And these are all distribution-free, and the reason they're distribution-free is they're based on ranks. So the idea is if I could get a multivariate analog of ranks which have certain nice properties, maybe I could do the same things for, for all of these beyond d equal to 1, okay? So, and that brings me to the connection to optimal transport. So now let's uh, digress in some sense and talk about optimal transport. So uh, as we know, uh, as I spent probably talked about, um, uh, Monge was the first person who formulated the optimal transport problem. So his problem was, so you have uh, some sand, and you have a sinkhole, and you can only take, a, say, a grain of, so, uh, of sand and place it in this. Of course, I'm assuming that the volumes of these two are the same. So x is being transported to t of x, which is y. And uh, Monge asked the problem, what is the best way, or what is the cheapest way of transporting this? So I want to transport the entire distribution to this distribution and what is the best way of doing it. So mathematically, you can formulate this in this way. I have a cost function which measures the cost of transporting x to y. So x to y, the cost. And this cost, usually in this talk, will be taken to be the square Euclidean distance. 
And uh, you have an initial distribution, x follows uh, nu, so that's this distribution nu. I want to find the map, which is this map t, which transports the distribution nu to a, to a distribution mu, that's mu. So t of x has to have distribution mu. And I want, and again, I don't, of course, there can be many, many such maps which transport mu to mu, but I want a map which has the smallest cost. Okay, so that's really what Monge posed about 250 years back. Is that clear? That, that's obviously, that's something that you've already seen. So why is this relevant? Uh, so let's try to understand what is the solution to the optimal transport problem in one dimension. So when d equal to one, so now I have two distributions, um, uh, mu and nu, with CDFs, f nu and f nu. The goal is to transport the distribution nu, which is the data distribution, to a distribution mu. So x follows nu, uh, and I want to make sure that t of x, the transported distribution has, follows, has distribution mu. And it has to be an optimal transport map, so it must minimize this cost, the cost of transporting x to t of x, squared expectation with respect to the law mu. So that's what I want to do. So here is a picture which might give you some idea. I want to transport this distribution to this distribution. This is a pictorial representation of how you would do it. So points here are taken to points here, points here are taken to points here. But now I want to see, can I explicitly find out what is the, what is the optimal map? Indeed, in d equal to one, we can, and that is what we were going to do. So now, uh, let's do this sort of experiment. Okay, so, so a point here is taken here. So suppose t is the optimal map. It takes the point here to a point here, and that's x naught. x one is a point here, and suppose t takes this point to, the, the optimal t takes it to this t x one. Now, the fact that it's the best t obviously means if I switch this, if I now take x naught, to this point, t, which is t of x1, and if I take x1, which is this point, to t of x0, the cost will be larger, right? That's obvious, because t is the optimal one. It minimizes the cost. Now you just do a simplification, just do some simple algebra. You would see if x1 is larger than x0, that will invariably mean t of x1 must be more larger than t of x0. So what you immediately get, that the optimal transport map has to be a non-decreasing function. At least in one dimension, we do get this. Not only that, we can explicitly say what function it has to be. And to do that, let's try to understand this. So, so what is the chance that x lies in this interval minus infinity to x? Of course, that's f mu of x. Now, if t is an optimal, t is a non-decreasing function, then uh, it's the same as saying t of x lies in this interval, right? Now, t of x has the distribution mu. So this becomes f mu of t of x. And now you can just solve and you get the optimal map has to be f mu inverse f mu. So for dimension one, I explicitly know what is the optimal transport map. Okay? And, and you can see that it's, 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 it's a function, it's dependent on the CDFs of the underlying two distributions. Okay? Yes. Notationally, is, it, is that a Hadamard product? What's the circle thing? Oh, it just means it's composition. So for oh, example, composition. right, so it okay, means yeah. f mu inverse of f mu of x. Yeah, sorry, it's, like sorry, that was, yeah, it's not that legible. Okay, is that clear? Yes. No, actually not. Of course, uh, this algebra is much simpler, but you can show that essentially for any convex loss, the same answer is true. But that's only true for one dimension. As you go beyond one dimension, the answers will be different depending on the loss. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, good. So uh, what have we shown till now? We have just said in one dimension, uh, the optimal transport map has this form. Now let's now let's try to connect. So this is basically some basic theory in optimal transport. Let me try to connect to what we are doing. So we wanted to study ranks, correct? So now if I have an absolutely continuous distribution mu, f mu being the CDF, which I will call f, the rank of a small x point is just f of x. It's just the evaluation of the CDF at the point x. I want to make 
I want to claim now that the CDF is indeed the optimal transport map. Of course, we know this very famous property that, that f of, if x follows f, f of x follows uniform 0, 1. Call this as the mu distribution. So f, we know, is a, is a transport map because f transports the distribution of the data x to uniform 0, 1. Not only is it any transport map, it is the optimal transport map. Because we know this is the form of the optimal transport map. If, if mu is a uniform 0, 1 distribution, then this is identity. T is just f of mu. So we do see that in one dimension, uh, the CDF is actually the optimal transport map. OK? And this is crucial. Because now we are just going to say, OK, uh, how do we define ranks? Just use the optimal transport way. OK. okay. So I'll explain the details here. But is this clear? So I've just emphasized and I've brought in the connection with the ranks. The rank is the optimal transport map. Yes? No, there is just one random variable here, though. X is my data distribution. And I have the uniform 0, 1 distribution, which is my reference distribution, as you may call it. I'm transporting the distribution X to uniform 0, 1. And you know that is what the CDF does. The CDF transports the distribution x to uniform 0, 1. Okay. Is that clear? So uh, now I want to say, OK, the sample ranks are also essentially the same. So what are the sample ranks? Suppose now I have IID data, uh, x1 to xn. Uh, so the, the sample ranks mean that these xi's are taken to some j over n. And how is this assignment done? In this axis, I have the data points. I have 10 data points ordered. So this is x bracket 1, which is the smallest observation, x bracket 10, the largest observation. And here I have the i over n's. And the rank map essentially is a bijection, right? It takes one xi to some j over n. And how does it do this? It actually solves the optimal transport problem. So what it does is I can, of course, I know the smallest observation has to be taken to 1 over n. The second smallest has to be taken to 2 over n, and so on. But how is this done? You can pose the Rn hat as the solution to this minimization problem, where you are trying to minimize. Uh, so xi is, will be taken to some j over n uh, such that uh, this minimum, this, uh, this sum of the square distance is, is minimum. To see why is that the same, of course, you can just expand out. Summation xi's have no role to play. That you can forget. Some, some summation t of xi's. Now, by the way, t has to be an optimal transport map. What t is doing is, if you have data, your, ori your best guess for your mu or your data distribution is empirical distribution, mu n. Is this notation familiar to all of you? This is the empirical distribution of the data. That's, so that's your best guess of, your, of the underlying mu distribution. And what you have here is a sort of a discretization of the uniform 0, 1 distribution. That's your best guess to the uniform 0, 1 distribution. And you are trying to find out the optimal transport map that transports this distribution to this distribution. No, this distribution puts mass 1 over n at each of the xi's. This distribution puts mass 1 over n at each of the i over n's. So a transportation invariably means some xi has to be taken to some j over n. And it essentially amounts to finding out which xi is going to be taken to which j over n. And now you, you try to write this equation. You, you break it up, and you write it in this form. You just see that the cross product term uh, just makes a difference. And now I have written it in, in terms of increasing order of the xi's. And by the rearrangement inequality, to maximize this, uh, t has to be in the same tone as the x's. So t has to be an increasing function. And so I know t of x sub i has to be just i over n. So what have I shown? That not only is the population uh, rank map an optimal transport map, the sample rank map is also an optimal transport map of the natural discretization. OK? So now let's go to the multivariate version. How are we going to define multivariate ranks? So now uh, imagine I have x, which has a distribution mu. Mu is in Rd. D is bigger than or equal to 1. 
I'm going to assume it's an absolutely continuous distribution. So I want to now find the optimal transport map that transports the data distribution to uniform 0, 1 to the power d. This is what I will call as my reference distribution. So in one dimension, I transported everything to uniform 0, 1. Now I'm saying I'm going to transport everything to uniform 0, 1 to the power d. You may ask why uniform 0, 1 to the power d? Yes, that's not the only choice. You could have transported it to the ball of radius 1 around 0. But for some reasons, and we'll be clear for the later part of the talk, that this is a nice distribution to transport it to. So I want to find a map that does this transportation. And how do I want to do it? And uh, the rank, the multivariate rank function will be defined as the optimal transport map that transports the, 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 the data distribution mu to mu, which is uniform 0, 1 to the power d. So you basically are trying to solve this problem. Now, as you know, um, that this problem has a solution. Note that the Monge's problem need not always have a solution. But if you have an absolutely continuous distribution, you can transport it to any distribution. So of course, you can define a, an R like that. What are some nice properties of this R? Now, this R is a map from Rd to Rd, in fact, to 0 and to the power d. And that is going to be crucial. So the first thing is that this R characterizes the distribution. If I have two distributions, P1 and P2, uh, if the rank maps defined in this fashion are equal for every x in Rd, that means the two distributions are the same. So I have a quantity that characterizes the distribution. I have a quantity that's invertible. And this is where the CDF fails. The CDF can still be defined from Rd to R, but it's a map from Rd to R, which will not have a nice inverse. It cannot have a homeomorphism. Whereas this function, so this is like my invertible distribution function, which is what I will define as the multivariate rank function. So of course, this R is now invertible under some regularity conditions. It's the only regularity I need is, is the underlying distribution be absolutely continuous. Then it has an inverse. The inverse is what is called a quantile function in one dimension. And indeed, there is a theory that talks about a multivariate quantile as this function Q. I'll not go into that. And not only are these invertible, these R and Q are nice maps. They are actually gradients of convex functions. So they have nice structures also. So this is, again, theory from optimal transport, mostly due to Grenier and some generalizations by Macan, which I'll get to soon. Okay. So what I want to say is this R map, the way to think about the R map, is it's like a distribution function, but it's an invertible distribution function which allows me to define ranks. OK? Any questions still here? So now I have said uh, the, I have defined a population rank map if uh, you have second moment for your data. Because if you don't have second moment, this optimization problem cannot be, is not well posed. But we know in one dimension, of course, by the way, of course, when d equal to 1, we know this r is the distribution function what I've shown. And the distribution function does not depend whether you have moments or not. And indeed, you can define R when this is plus infinity. And this is where Macan's theorem becomes so useful. So what Macan says is that, OK, suppose you have any, any absolutely continuous distribution. Again, absolute contiguity can also be relaxed. Then there exists only one or a unique map that transports the data distribution x to uniform 0, 1 to the power d, that's u, which is the gradient of a convex function. So of course, there are many maps that transport x to u. Again, I, I, I want to recall that u is uniform 0, 1 to the power d. But there is only one map, which is the gradient of a convex function. So phi is a convex function from rd to r, and the gradient is the derivative of that. Now you can say, what does this mean? What happens when d equal to 1? When d equal to 1, what is r? r is f. That's the CDF. The CDF is a monotone function. A gradient of a convex function in one dimension is basically a monotone increasing function. So that's nice. Not only that, if, if, if the second moment exists, this gradient of a convex function, which is not obtained by any minimization, is just a geometric representation, matches this R. So that, that's fairly neat. That if the moments exist, R can indeed be written as the minimizer of this optimization problem. If the moment does not exist, I can always say there exists a unique function 
which is the gradient of a convex function which transpose x to mu, and that is how I will define the rank function, even if the moments do not exist. Is that clear? So I have been able to say that there is an invertible CDF-like object from Rd, in, in, in Rd, which I call as R. Okay? So now the game is, how do I define a sample analog? From here on, it's going to be exactly the same repetition as I did in, in one dimension. So in one dimension, how did I define the sample rank? I had some uh, data, x1 to xn. Now they are in Rd. I chose some canonical points that are like unif that are representative of the uniform zero one distribution. I do the same thing. I choose some points C1 to Cn, which are canonical or uniform like points, and there is a huge literature, the field of quasi Monte Carlo, that tries to choose uniform like points in a high dimensional uh, in the uh, high dimensional hypercube, and I choose some of them. So again, when d equal to one, I took the Cis to be just i over n's. But of course, in multi-dimension, there are many, many choices. You can take them to be the gridded, or you can use any quasi-Monte Carlo sequence, like the Halton sequence, and so on. So let's fix something. And I'll give you an, an illustration of this. So the rank map, the, the sample rank map, would now transport uh, your empirical distribution of the data to, so this is a discretization of your new to a discretization of your uniform 0, 1. And the CIs, the empirical distribution of the CIs, give you the discretization of uniform 0, 1 to the power d that you want. Okay? So this is how I define the empirical rank maps. And this is a pictorial representation. So here there are, I think, uh, 30 points. You have basically the red dots are your data. And I have the uniform 0, 1 squared superimposed in this picture. And I have the green, at the blue, blue crosses. These are some canonical quasi Monte Carlo points in zero one squared. And I am trying to find uh, R in hat. Now uh, T has to be a transport map. Uh, and as all of these points have mass one over n, you can see a transport map is a bijection between this set and this set. So it must take an xi to some cj. And this is the solution of the matching problem that I have here. So, the, so I match this red point to this point, to this, this point to this point. And that's how you get at the ranks. And, and indeed, this is, this, these ranks give you a, you capture the geometry of the data. See, the northmost rightmost point is mapped to the northmost rightmost point, and so on. The points in the center are mapped to the points in the center, and so on. So this will be my empirical ranks. Okay. And now you can say, how do I solve this? This is the assignment problem. So it's really a matching problem. And now uh, this is where, of course, all the tools that um, Espen talked about yesterday might come to your, re your rescue. You can say that this is the same as the Wasserstein distance, which can be computed, which is a linear program. Not only is it a linear program, you can use the Hungarian algorithms to have a worst case algorithm with complexity order n cube. There are faster approximate algorithms also available. But this is certainly the worst case problem. This seems like a combinatorial problem, but it's not. This is actually a special case of a linear pro program. Is that clear? So I can solve this. I can get at r n hat. What's the first property of r n hat? Now I look at the rank vector. See, in one dimension, if you now think back, what was crucial about the ranks that led to distribution free property of all the tests based on ranks? The most important property was the ranks were themselves distribution free. So the vector of ranks, Rn hat of xi, as a vector, is distributed uniformly over all n factorial permutations of the CIs, whatever be the distribution of your original data. Okay? So, so basically, you see, Rn hat of x1 is some Cj. R n hat of x n is some again some C j prime, but they are all drawn uniformly from the n factorial permutations, and that's the first important result. So basically, I have reduced the data to the ranks, and and I know the distribution of this rank vector. So any test statistic that I compute from the rank vector will automatically be distribution free. So this is of course the first step to computing a distribution free test, but this is not enough. I need some regularity. 
are in hats, you must be well behaved for the, for, for the test to have found one. And then the first result we have in this direction is that this R in hats converge to R, the population version, as you might expect, right? This was uh, the solution to the optimal transport problem obtained from a natural discretization of the continuous version. So you might expect R in hat to converge to R. And that is indeed what happens. Now note R is not necessarily a solution to an optimization problem. R can, if the moments don't exist, is a unique gradient of a convex function. Now this gives you some regularity. And here is actually an, an open problem, I feel. What is, not much is known about the rate of convergence of R in hat to R. There's a recent paper by Rigole and Hutter that talks about transport maps and estimation rates for optimal transport maps. What they show is that R in hat, as the dimension goes large, will have, will suffer from the personal dimensionality, will suffer from the usual non-parametric, um, the way non-parametric estimates suffer from the smoothness of R. And they have a lower bound, but they cannot study the estimation of R in hat as I have defined. And it's, I think it's still unknown what is the estimation accuracy of R in hat as defined in this fashion. But we don't really need it. OK, okay I have uh, quite a bit of time. So uh, now I'm going to move to the two examples. So before this, before I move, are there any questions? So what have I done? I have just defined multivariate ranks. And these multivariate ranks crucially use the theory of optimal transport. To freely find the sample uh, multivariate ranks, all you need to solve is the assignment problem, which is easy. OK, so now let's do the two sample goodness of fit testing problem. So now I have xi's coming from distribution p1, yj is coming from distribution p2. And the dimension is going to be bigger than one. I want to test whether the two distributions are the same versus they're not the same. So now the, the, the strategy is, is very similar to what we did in the first part of the talk. We should start with a good test. So we, we agreed on that the two the uh, t statistic, the two sample t statistic is a good test when d is equal to one. Now we have to agree on a good test. And there are um, a, a sort of a array of good tests. You can use energy statistics, which is something that the statisticians like, I think, quite a bit, pioneered by Zekeli and his co-authors. Or you can use uh, kernel-based methods, the maximum mean discrepancy kind of tests. So start with some test which can test these two. So I will describe the energy statistics here. But uh, everything follows the same way, especially for the MMD tests. But there is nothing special about the MMD test, too. You can choose any good test as you like, which is not distribution free. Uh, and I will, and we will develop a method which will give you something that is distribution free, robust to outliers, and robust to distributional assumptions. So the energy statistic between is a, is or the energy distance between two distributions, P1 and P2, is a thought is basically something like this. Note h of st is just the norm of s minus t. So it's the expectation of the norm of x minus y um, minus expectation of the norm of x minus x prime, where x prime and x are iid copies from p1. And it's something like this. You can show that this is always non-negative. Why is it important in the two sample problem? Because it is 0 if and only if p1 is equal to p2. So this can, so this can be a good way to see. So we may compute it for two distributions, p1 and p2. If this is 0, we know p1 is equal to p2. Of course, we will not have access to, these to the population expectations. We have sample versions. So we'll compute a sample analog to this. And if it's close to 0, we, we would say the null is true. If this is far away from 0, we would say the alternative is true. That's a rough idea. And these are very easy objects. These are expectations. A expectations are very, very easy to estimate. So that's what is done here. So the energy statistic is basically the sample analog to this. So I have three expectations, and I just uh, replace the population expectation with the sample expectation. So I have the expectation where x and y, x comes from p1, y comes from p2. I, I, I approximate this expectation by h of xi comma yj, and I average over all xi and yj. So this leads to a v statistic, which is really like a u statistic. And I have this as my E statistic. And now, here is the energy test that was proposed in 
Zekele 2003, which is to look at this uh, statistic if this is very large, reject the null hypothesis. Now, how large is large? We have to choose a critical value, which will depend on the distribution of this energy statistic, which in turn depends on the distribution P1 and P2. So that's the point, that this critical value depends on P1 and P2. Although I must confess that you can do a permutation-based test, which will need a lot of uh, permutation samples have to be drawn, and you have to repeat the whole thing again and again. Whereas what are we going to do now? We are going to propose a rank version of this, which is going to be distribution-free, which will have critical values that do not depend on the underlying P1 or P2. So this gives rise to the rank energy statistic. So what is the rank energy statistic? Again, the same principle. How did I get the Wilcoxon rank sum test from the t-test? What did I do? I replaced the xi's and the yj's by their respective ranks. So I look at the pooled rank of this m plus n observations, pooling all the xi's and the yj's. And the ranks are obtained by, by, by transporting this m plus n observations to the m plus n uniform light points in 0, 1 to the power t. And I get the multivariate ranks. And then I separate out the ranks of the xi's and the ranks of the yj's. And I compute the energy distance between these two rank vectors, as opposed to the xi's and the yj's. OK? So this is essentially the same principle that we did to get the Wilcoxon rank sum test from the t-test. And the first thing, as these are obtained, from the ranks, which are under, which under the null hypothesis is itself distribution free, we know the distribution of R of the rank energy statistic is free of the P1, if as long as P1 is continuous, is absolutely continuous. So the distribution of this quantity only depends on the CIs, which are in some sense a nuisance. Of course, in one dimension, we have to choose the I over Ns. And some people can argue why I over Ns. But, but now the next step, as I will show, it really does not depend on the CIs that much. But, in, but the exact distribution of, our, of the rank energy statistic depends on the CIs. It depends on the two sample sizes and the dimension, but not on the underlying distribution. Okay? So of course, the rank energy test would reject when the rank energy statistic exceeds a critical value. The critical value only depends on M on N and the CIs. It does not depend on P1. Okay? So now you can say, okay, the choice of the CIs are the same. Indeed, you don't have to deal with that. The first theorem here says, if M and N are large, and the CIs, of course, they are uniform like points, so you would expect them, if you choose them so that the distribution of the CIs converge to the uniform 0, 1 distribution, then the rank energy statistic converges to a universal distribution, a fixed distribution that does not depend at all on the data generating mechanism P1. This is actually an infinite mixture of chi squares, which is what you get for U statistic theory, for a degenerate U statistic theory. But it's just more complicated because the ranks are not independent, right? So this, the this theorem is not obvious, I must say. And of course, this lambda j is these weights are universal. It does not depend on the CIs at all. Sorry? So they would get from the eigen decomposition of the kernel. So, so, so you can think of the energy test as having a kernel. The kernel would also have a kernel. And, and, and the lambda j's are basically the eigenvalues corresponding to a centered version of the kernel. And the main takeaway from this is that the effect of the CIs really vanish in the long run, because this is a universal distribution. So, so the critical values you would obtain from R, E, M, N, although will depend on the CIs, but as, as M and N grow large, will not depend on the CIs. Okay? Not only that, you can talk about the power. Is this test consistent? Of course. As soon as you have a fixed alternative, so I'm choosing a P1, which is not equal to P2. Both have to be absolutely continuous. And of course, the sample sizes have to be between, means they have to converge to sort of a lambda between 0 and 1. Then the test will have power 1. So if P1 is not equal to P2, this test will be able to differentiate between the two. And this is where, although it's kind of hidden, you need the invertibility. You see, uh, when is the rank energy statistic zero? The rank energy statistic will be zero when the rank of x and the rank of y's have the same distribution. But as the ranks are invertible, 
that is the same as x and y having the same distribution. So, so the invertibility is actually quite crucial here. Okay, now you may ask, what happens to this complicated looking object when d equals one? We can show that in d equals one, this reduces to the two sample Kramer one, this is statistic. So of course, uh, this is, uh, so if I want to test uh, the equality of two distributions, the most naive thing to do would be look at the empirical distribution function of the x sample, the empirical distribution function of the y sample, look at the difference. And somehow, the, uh, take an average, this is a weighted average, or you can, uh, so, and this is what is called the Kramer von Mises statistic, and you can show that this rank energy is exactly the same as this. And, I, and as I said, there's nothing particular about the rank energy. The, this is a general principle. The principle being, if you have a test which you like, uh, I can make it distribution free, I can make it more robust, I can make it uh, less reliant on the data distributions by using ranks. And so, so this is how it would work out if you, if you are a kernel guy and if you want to use the maximum mean discrepancy and you take some kernel, then this is the uh, maximum mean discrepancy between two distributions, P1 and P2, which looks awfully similar to what I started with. Here, K is now a kernel. But you can do the same thing exactly as I did before and the same results hold. Is that okay? Is that okay? So uh, here is some illustration as, as um, how it performs. So what have I done? I have taken uh, three variates. So I have, let me try to write it down if I can. So I have basically x1, x2, x3. It's a very simple toy example, but it's illustrative. Has a normal um, uh, 0, 0, 0, and identity, identity 3. And the y has the y1, y2, y3, has trivariate normal, of course, with mu, 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 and identity. It's a shift, right? And uh, you want to see whether the two samples have the same distribution. Of course, if mu is equal to zero, they, have, they are from the same distribution. And here is, as you change mu, this is what the power of the test shift how the power of the tests change. Of course, you can imagine if you go farther from zero, or most tests will have, will have power one. And here I've compared the energy statistic in blue, the rank energy in red, the cross match. This is a test by Rosenbaum, which is also distribution free. And this is a test by Heller et al, which, is, which actually performs quite well in our simulation study. Here you see everything is normal like we, the, the energy statistic does slightly better than us. We are red. The, the, the energy statistic is actually blue. It does slightly better than us, as can be expected. Like in the Wilcoxon uh, rank sum test, is slightly worse than the T statistic when the data is random. And now what you do is that you, you replace, you, you have normal, you make them log normal. Just make it slightly skewed, and the scenario just changes. Now we have higher power compared to the energy statistic. And, and you can actually see that the, this, this, this uh, Rosenbaum's cross match test has really no power at all. And again, this goes back to the efficiency calculations, which I cannot go into the details in this talk. Okay, just in, those, just in illustration. Again, a bunch of simulation scenarios. I don't want you to take much other than the fact that there are situations where this is rank energy, where we, we do well. And there are situations where others do slightly better than us. But overall, this is the exact thing that people observed using rank-based methods. It's generally quite good. Uh, it's, of course, robust. Uh, and uh, and quite often has as good performance as the best methods. Uh, the other thing you may wonder is, OK, you have to choose the CIs. The CIs are a pain in some sense. And how would that affect the critical value? We have already seen that uh, as M and N are slightly large, the choice of the CIs are not that important. And here I'm trying to illustrate that asymptopia is reached quite early. So in dimension two and dimension eight, I have the critical value of the test as I change the sample sizes. So M and N is 10, 300, 500, 700, 900. And you see that critical values essentially remain the same. So, so essentially all that means is if I have a 
two-dimensional problem. I give you the uh, 0.39, and that's a universal critical value you can use in any problem as you want. There is no permutation-based method that is necessary. And automatically, this guarantees the fact you are robust to outliers, contamination, and so on. Does that make sense? So now, let me quickly uh, talk about the independence testing problem. So in the independence testing problem, so this is the problem. I have x, y uh, jointly distributed. x is v1-dimensional, y is v2-dimensional. I want to test is x, if x is independent of y. I have uh, iid data. Again, the procedure is the same. You first start with a good method, or a method that you like. Here I have taken distance covariance. Again, this has been quite used in statistics in the last 10, 15 years. If you are a kernel guy, you might take HSIC, the Hilbert-Smith independence criterion. It's essentially very, very similar. And in fact, they are kind of equivalent. So again, you, you come up with, a, with a, a distance, which is 0 if and only if x is independent of y, and is greater than 0 in general. And again, the nice thing about this statistic, although it's more complicated than the previous example, it's still expectations. And expectations can be easily uh, estimated if I have samples. So the important property is this distance covariance is 0 if and only if x is independent of y, and it's always greater than or equal to 0 otherwise. So I want to, this is the population quantity. I can have a sample quantity. And of course, the sample quantity is obtained by, if it's x, x prime, y, y prime. I, if I have xi, the, I have xj, yi, yj. I have this v statistic that can estimate this population quantity. And the idea is the same. I, I look, I compute this sample analog. If this is large, if this is significantly different from zero, I reject the null hypothesis. If it's close to zero, I may accept the null hypothesis. How close is close will depend on a critical value that in principle will depend on px and py. And, I, and the question is, can I find a distribution to critical value? Okay. So um, this is the distance covariance test. Of course, this critical value depends on px and py, the marginal distribution of x and the marginal distribution of y. The rank energy distance, the, sorry, the rank distance covariance is the same principle that gave rise to the Spearman's rank correlation from the usual rank correlation. Sorry, from the usual correlation. What is the Spearman's rank correlation? You compute the correlation, the usual correlation, but not with the xi's, but with the ranks of the xi's. So now you have to take the marginal ranks and not the joint ranks. So you do the multivariate ranks, as we discussed, through optimal transport. This gives you a grid in 0, 1 to the power d1. This and the y's are taken to a grid or, or some set of n, n many points in 0, 1 to the power d2. And now you just play with these things. Automatically, the test you get is going to be distribution free because it's obtained from, from the ranks. And not only that, uh, so the critical value now will only depend on the CIs. And there is no dependence on the, on the marginal distribution of x and the marginal distribution of y. Of course, it depends on the dimensions of the problem and the sample size. And as you might expect in the previous case, it does not depend on the CIs if the, if the sample size is large. In fact, we can show if x and y are absolutely continuous, under the null hypothesis, this rank distance covariance converges to a universal distribution, which again is of the form of an infinite mixture of chi-squares, which says that the critical value, if n is large, can be this one God-given number that depends on d1 and d2, and nothing else. Of course, this test also has power 1 under minimal assumptions. No moment assumptions are necessary. As you might see, the distance covariance and so on, they need moment assumptions here. You don't need any moment assumptions. It's a distribution free test um, that has a universal critical value and it has asymptotic power one. Is that okay? So uh, again, in d equal to d1 equal to d2 equal to 1, this is very similar to Hoibding's test for independence. As you might see, what would you do in one dimension? You'd look at the joint CDF and look at the product of the marginals. You'd take some weighted average. That's what it is done. And again, there's nothing profound about. Uh, using the distance covariance. You could have used HSIC or any other method. So I'll basically summarize with this. So basically, what have I uh, talked about today? I talked about a framework for getting distribution free increments in using multivariate rank defined through optimal transport. 
And um, as you will see, this has uh, many, many other uh, applications. I have talked about equality of two distributions. You can talk about equality of k distributions, independence of, of k vectors, test for multivariate symmetry, and so on. And in general, these tests have, are distribution free. They have good efficiency in general. They are robust to outliers and contamination. And of course, the, the most of the talk is based on this paper, which is available in archive. What is left is, of course, to get at the asymptotic efficiency results, which, come, which somehow cement the fact that the Wilcoxon rank sum test is a good test to do in one dimension. We don't have those results yet. We are working on these at this point of time. And of course, other applications. There are going to be numerous, many applications. We are still trying to explore this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So, um, so I read yesterday the uh, Evan Vogel test. N cube is actually not great at N. Yes. Yes. Is, is there something that you can do to increase the entropy regularized? Yes. So, uh, so of course, we did not try to investigate that because the assignment problem is really a 70, 80 year old problem that has been very well studied. So yes, if you want to solve the assignment problem, if you have an approximate solution, you can use the same thing. Although you will get an approximate rank. Well, but will the will be distribution free? It's an approximate solution. So uh, well, let's say it actually solves. I I don't really know how the approximation is done. I shouldn't, uh, but. The distribution freeness comes from the fact that no point is given preference over the other. And I, but I do not know these approximate algorithms. There is a big literature on approximate algorithms to solve the assignment problem. Uh, I, that, that's a good question. Can one algorithm, one approximate algorithm be shown to, be to lead to distribution free ranks? I would think so, but I don't, I haven't looked at that particular problem. Yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, you can use the asymptotics, uh, or you can just simulate from from the permutations, because you know it's going to be so. Yeah, so so you just generate the CIs uh, and and you compute the statistic. I mean, so, sorry, CIs are fixed. You, I mean, you you solve a different assignment problem. No, sorry, what am I saying? So uh, all you need to do here is to find out, so, okay, so let's go here, right? Uh, so what would you do? Uh, so this, so under the null hypothesis, uh, these ranks, if you combine these ranks are distributed uniformly over all permutations, all n factorial permutations of the C i ones. These are distributed uniformly over all n factorial permutations of C i twos. And you draw from that and compute the statistic. That's all you would do. You can. You can do that. You can. But I do feel that, so uh, we haven't, of course, explored this for really high dimensions. But, and where I'm not sure how fast asymptopia is reached. But if I have slightly smallish dimensions, you can just use the asymptotic uh, critical values, which are easy to tabulate, and, pe and people can use them. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.